So moving on to our very last set of notes in unit four, and this one being on perception again, but how we interpret things and how, essentially how we perceive them in the first place, um, not just organizing them. So restored vision. After cataract surgery, blind adults were able to regain sight. These individuals could differentiate figure and ground relationships. However, they had difficulty discriminating a circle and a triangle because they hadn't seen them in so long, right, that their brains were essentially changed, saying a lot about how exposure to different things in our environment changes our brain and therefore lack of exposure to things also changes our brain. Facial recognition. After blind adults were able to regain sight, they were unable to recognize faces. They would only recognize individual distinct features. I find this incredibly, incredibly intriguing. Normal observers also show difficulty in facial recognition when the lower half of the pictures are changed. And this is kind of with our feature detectors, right? This means that under stimulation of our feature detectors in our occipital lobe, in our visual cortex, causes them to kind of lose some of their ability. So sensory deprivation, kind of going along with this theme of how our brain is changed when we lack certain stimulus. Our perception is changed when we lack certain sensations. So kittens were actually raised without exposure to horizontal lines. So they kind of were put in this cage, and this makes me so sad as an animal person, right? They were put in a cage with one of the cones on their head, and they, the cage, the walls of it were only horizontal lines. So they then had difficulty perceiving, or I'm sorry, were only vertical lines. So when they were taken out of that environment after, I don't know, three weeks or so, they had difficulty, they actually could not perceive anything horizontal. Like it, even if their, their like food bowl was only horizontal and not like vertic uh, somehow vertical, however you would do that, um, they, couldn't, they couldn't perceive it. It suggests that vision is at least partly an acquired sense because so much of what we see is perceptually interpreted that our sensation, both of them, our sensation and our perception is impacted by a lack of stimulation. So we talked about sensory adaptation. Let's talk about perceptual adaptation. This is kind of a, a funny image on the right-hand side here. Um, the guy on the right obviously wearing some kind of contraption. He's wearing goggles that actually turns everything upside down in your visual field. Kind of scary. So the visual ability to adjust to an artificially displaced visual field, like with prism glasses where everything's turned upside down. Um, or think about the drunk goggles you used in driving school. We humans can even adapt to an upside down world. Eventually that person will adapt and find that person's hand. Okay, so it takes them a few hours of wearing the goggles, but then when they take the goggles off, they're all messed up again. They actually have to adapt again to normal reality. So perceptual set, let's talk about perceptual set. Read this sentence, time flies, I can't throw too fast. Wow, Whoa. like that doesn't even really make sense. How about we put in some punctuation? Time flies, I can't, they're too fast. So time flies being the first like demand. Go time the bugs, the flies. I can't, they're too fast. Your perceptual set does not allow you to solve that problem because you're like, what do you mean go time flies? I, I don't do that, right? You don't do that. So you don't even perceive that as a possibility of, of fixing that sentence. Um, a mental predisposition, this is the definition of perceptual set, it's a mental predisposition, meaning you're predisposed to perceive one thing and not another. So what you see in the center picture is influenced by the flanking pictures. So if you look at the left picture first, you probably see the guy with the, what is that, saxophone or something. So then if you look at the middle image, you probably see him again. Whereas if you look at the image on the right, you probably see the woman's face and hair. So if you look back to the image in the middle, you probably see her more predominantly than the man playing the saxophone. So you can actually be predisposed to perceive things a certain way. So usually perceptual sets lead us to fairly accurate conclusions, but sometimes they can lead us astray.
astray. So the picture on the left, is that the Loch Ness Monster? Or is it a tree trunk in the river? Or B, are those flying saucers? Or are those clouds, right? Like, oh wow, those look so cool. Those are like aliens, UFOs. Not really. Okay, let's talk about schemas. And we're gonna talk about this more in unit nine with development. Schemas are concepts. Well, they aren't concepts. They are characteristics of concepts that help us organize and interpret unfamiliar information. So as children, we don't have exposure to a lot of different concepts in our lives. And even as adults, as we experience new and newer things, we don't have a concept or schema for certain things. Okay, so we organize stuff. And when we perceive new information, we do so incorrectly sometimes. So children's schemas represent reality as well as their abilities to represent what they see. So schemas develop through experience. So for instance, this image of trees, right? It's just two like boxes and dots on the end and people are just big heads with arms and legs. Like they don't even look at someone's torso and perceive that, they just see someone as a big head. <laughs> yes, that's the most important part of them, right? All right, context affects um, a given stimulus can evoke radically different perceptions. So based on the immediate context of the stimulus. So context effects is when, say, you say to your parents, oh my gosh, mom, the cops are at the door because I totally just robbed a gas station. And your mom's like, oh my God, what? And you're like, I'm just kidding. I just got a D on my last test. They're like, oh, now the D doesn't, doesn't seem that bad, right? Like, oh, whew. It's not that bad. You put the D into context of I'm not really a, you know, armed robber and criminal on the run from the police. So that's some context effects for you. But then there's some cultural context. So context instilled by culture also alters our perception. So in the picture on the left, you probably see like these two people sitting here in a window to the outside. Um, in the picture of the right, um, you see like this pole in the background that maybe it's like a light or something like that. To an East African person, the sitting woman here is actually balancing metal box on her head and the family is sitting under a tree. Because their culture predisposes them, it instills a certain context. Yes, there are people who carry things on their heads in different African countries and cultures, right? Um, and there are some trees in on the continent of Africa that look like this and not really so much here, especially not in the Midwest. So some perception revisited. Is perception innate or is it acquired, right? It's perception is our version of reality and there's lots of things contributing to it and this is going back to the biopsychosocial approach. The biological being, the sensory analysis, the unlearned visual phenomena, um, also the critical period for sensory development also having the psychological influences, and this is more of like the gestalt principles, perceptual set, selective attention, um, and then social cultural ones, like with the last one and cultural context, cultural assumptions and expectations and physical context effects, all contributing to how we perceive different stimuli. Perception and human factors. Human factors, um, psychologists design machines that assist our natural perception. Okay, they're, they're taking in human factors to produce products and manufacture products that are better for us. So the knobs for the stove burners on the right are easier to understand than the ones on the left. Right, that's human factors used to manufacture better products. Understanding human factors can enable us in designing equipment that can avoid disaster. Two thirds of airline crashes are due to human errors, largely based on errors of perception and not seeing the runway as they should see it or as it is in reality. So they actually mess up the landing, which could mean a lot of serious bad things. All right, extrasensory perception. This is ESP, right? Perception without sensory input is called extrasensory perception or ESP. A large percentage of scientists do not believe in ESP because they say it doesn't exist. There's no scientific basis. So paranormal phenomena include claims of astrological predictions, psychic healing, communication with the dead, out-of-body experience, but the most relevant are telepathy, clairvoyance, and precognition. And here's kind of an overview of a lot of them. Telepathy is mind-to-mind -mind communication, like reading minds. 
So one person sending thoughts and the other receiving it, communicating via their minds. A clairvoyance is perception of remote events that are happening right now. Okay, so, oh, I have this image in my brain of my house being broken into right now. Not in the future, right now. That's clairvoyance. Precognition is perceiving future events, such as a political leader's death or a car accident that I'm going to get into on the way home, something like that. It's seeing it in the future. And then psychokinesis is performing physical tasks with your mind. Like, I am going to pick up this mouse with my mind and not my hand. Premonitions are pretensions. Pretensions. So can psychics see the future? Can psychics aid police in identifying locations of dead bodies? Psychics are sometimes sought out for their opinion by different parties. What about psychic predictions of famous, you know, Nostradamus and all of that, like the end of the world? The answers to these questions are no. Nostradamus predictions are retrofitted to events that took place afterwards. A psychic has not predicted surprising events in history like 9-11 or Princess Diana's death. No, not true. So putting ESP to experimental tests, um, they did this with 28,000 individuals. Wiseman tested psych um, psychically influencing or predicting a coin toss. People were able to correctly influence or predict a coin toss 50% of the time. Yet they still, oh, I'm able to do it. Well, you have a 50-50 shot of predicting what's going on there, right? <laughs> they can't validate the claims of ESP because they cannot replicate the instances of the supposed abilities in lab conditions. It's not psychologically or psych scientifically supported, therefore it can't be true. What do you think?